Okay, it's looking like we have about 20 people on the call right now. Should I go ahead and get started with the introduction? Sounds good. Okay. All right. Um, Dr. Frederick Barrett has been conducting psychedelic research at Johns Hopkins University since 2013, and his research in healthy participants and in patients with mood and substance use disorders focuses on the psychological and neurological mechanisms underlying the enduring therapeutic and other effects of psychedelic drugs. In 2017, he received an NIH R03 grant to investigate biological mechanisms of psilocybin effects, the first federally funded research since the 1970s admir administering a classic psychedelic to people with psychedelic effects as the primary focus. He developed the first comprehensive questionnaire to measure subjective aspects of challenging experiences encountered with psilocybin. He also published the first studies in humans characterizing the enduring effects of psilocybin on the brain, the effects of psilocybin on a brain structure called the claustrum, which has been proposed to variously mediate consciousness and cognition, the effects of LSD on the brain's response to music, and the effects of the atypical hallucinogen, hallucinogen Salvinorin A on human brain network function. He is currently leading a clinical trial to investigate the use of psilocybin to treat patients with major depressive disorder and co-occurring alcohol use disorder. And he is leading a number of ongoing studies aimed at better understanding the psychological, biological, and neural mechanisms underlying therapeutic efficacy of psychedelic drugs. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Barrett. And um, for the people who are attending, we will um, let, we'll have some time at the end for a Q&A. So during the presentation, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Nicole, for the invitation and for the, for the kind uh, introduction. Um, I, uh, I'm going to basically give a, a talk that's very similar to the talk that I gave um, to uh, the, the uh, CARTA Symposium, Altered States of the Human Mind, Implications for Anthropogeny, um, uh, hopefully not assuming uh, that anybody has a particular level of expertise or understanding of this stuff. And I, uh, I'm going to apologize in advance if I if I let the jargon get the better of me. Um, please do you know feel free to ask any questions or ask for any clarifications because I do enjoy trying to translate into you know out out, out of jargon into regular you know English. Uh, <laughs> and and um, I'll, I'm just going to try to give really an overview of. Um, of psychedelic research as it stands uh, now, um, <clears throat> there are uh, you know yeah a lot of uh, programs of research either really just getting underway or or beginning to blossom around the world, including a number of places in California. Nicole and I were just briefly chatting about the three separate research centers in the Bay Area that have recently been announced, and and also one at at UC San Diego um, that is really exciting. Uh, time to be involved in this research uh, and frankly I'm just kind of grateful to be involved in it it's uh, there's just so many questions to ask uh, and 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 uh, it, it kind of gets me up in the in, in the morning sometimes knowing that if, if if we all do our duty and do our due diligence as scientists we may actually end up helping a lot of people which is uh, not something that anybody should take for granted uh, especially scientists in psychology and psychiatry. Um, okay, well, that's enough of me babbling about that. Um, we're going to talk about psychedelics, but but it might start, it might help to start with just a question, you know, what are psychedelic drugs? Um, the, the term psychedelic was coined by Humphrey Osmond, who is an English psychiatrist who is expatriated to Canada, who along with a colleague, Abram Hoffer, 
was the first, uh, one of the first people to give LSD to patients diagnosed with alcoholism or what we'd call today, you know, alcohol use disorder. Osmond himself had tried LSD uh, as, did, as did many uh, scientists and physicians who, who, um, who used LSD in clinical research in the 50s and 60s. Um, Osmond had also given a number of psychedelic drugs to various colleagues, friends, and, and, and the like. He, he, he was known to give mescaline uh, which is a related compound to Aldous Huxley, who's a famous novelist and philosopher who then went on to pen The Doors of Perception based on his experience with mescaline. Um, if, you, if you look up uh, psychedelic in the, in the dictionary, you're going to get things like sensory perceptions being altered, perceptual distortion, hallucinations, or euphoria, or despair. And, and yeah, these, these things may uh, be kind of somewhat accurate, but it's not quite what Humphrey Osmond was thinking when he when he coined the, the term psychedelic. He was really uh, af after his own experiences with these drugs felt that uh, psychedelics manifested an aspect of the mind that otherwise may have been either inaccessible to people, generally speaking, uh, hidden or 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 otherwise you know kind of occulted. And and um, that's where he saw the real power of these drugs was was in this kind of mind manifesting um, uh, aspect or, or, or property. Um, a little more specifically, what, what, what drugs do we mean when we, when we talk about psychedelics? Well, the, the word psychedelic itself has, has also blossomed to become this huge umbrella. Uh, folks, folks call all sorts of drugs psychedelic, um, from the classic psychedelics like LSD and, and psilocybin uh, to, to MDMA, to ketamine, to, you know, some people even will consider uh, can, cannabinoids or uh to be to be psychedelics, and, and while we can debate that all day and night, I'm gonna I'm just gonna say up front that what I'm talking about are considered the classic psychedelics, uh, at least in the context of this talk, and those include at least three different pharmacological classes. And by pharmacological classes, I mean compounds that have you know, generally similar chemical structure, and those uh, include but are not limited to tryptamines such as psilocybin, which is contained in uh, hundreds of species of, of, of psychoactive mushrooms, as well as uh, uh, dimethyltryptamine and dimethyltryptamine DMT. Various forms of DMT are found in numerous plant and some animal sources, uh, such as 5-MeO uh, DMT. Um, and then we have phenethylamines, such as mescaline, which is found in psychoactive cacti, uh, as well as a whole family of uh, chemicals uh, called the 2C chemicals. One of the most infamous is 2CB. Uh, we also have ergolines, uh, which include the infamous uh, lysergic acid diethylamide LSD, which is a synthetic compound, or also lysergic acid amide, which is a naturally occurring compound in many plant sources. Um, these uh, drugs all share the ignoble property of being Schedule One compounds, which means as far as the DEA is concerned, they uh, are, are rather dangerous, have high abuse liability, uh, you know, some, some toxicity and, and, and no known uh, medical, no, no established medical uh, use, which um, within the next few years uh, may change, not necessarily the scheduling per se, but that last bit about known medical use. Um, they also, all, the, all of these compounds also share a particular molecular signaling property insofar as they uh, are active and, and have activity at a specific uh, neurotransmitter receptor in the brain called the serotonin 2A receptor. There are uh, I believe 14 different serotonin receptors in the brain. And these drugs not only bind, all, all of them bind to this one serotonin 2A receptor, um, but it is thought that binding to this serotonin 2A receptor is what kind of uh, is responsible for all of the things we think about when we think about the effects of psychedelic drugs. Um, and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, most of these drugs have what we would consider off-target affinities for other serotonin receptors. Uh, LSD is unique insofar as it has direct affinity for the dopamine one and two receptors, uh, meaning it, it'll directly latch onto and activate those receptors. None of the other classic psychedelic drugs will do that. Um, uh, but uh, the, these these are what I'm talking about when I when I think of classic psychedelic drugs. Just to kind of give a crash course in the history of use of psychedelics, um, there seems to be anthropological evidence suggesting uh, the ceremonial consumption of hallucinogenic plants and fungal matter uh, that have been uncovered in, and 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 point at least to the use over the past few centuries. And there's speculation that uh, there was ceremonial use of similar psychoactive compounds that date back many thousands of years. One of the, one of the putative uh, pieces of evidence 
uh, in favor of, of that hypothesis is this uh, this cave drawing of uh, the mushroom man. This is a you know humanoid figure with what seem to be or appear to be mushroom-like figures growing out of all uh, you know contact, you know, all parts of the skin and, and hands and head and body and legs and torso. And um, this is is taken as evidence by some that that um, you know mushrooms were used uh, ceremonially by I believe this cave drawing is supposed to date back at least many thousand years. I can't remember precisely. Um, uh, we, we do know that, that mushrooms uh, that contain psilocybin, I, I noted before, there are hundreds of species of mushroom around the world that are known to contain psilocybin and various uh, other psilocybin-like compounds such as biocystin or uh, psilocin. Uh, and um, those are found on all continents. Um, are they found in the Final continent? That's an interesting question. So, but uh, ceremonial use of psilocybin containing mushrooms by indigenous tribes in Mexico can be traced back at least to the 15th century. And there are a number of tribes uh, that are currently uh, identified to still consume uh, psilocybin mushrooms in a ceremonial context. Um, fast forward from, from all of that brief history and uh, many thousands of research volunteers were enrolled in therapeutic trials in the 50s and 60s. You know, it, it's thought that uh, uh, there are a couple different people who are responsible for having brought uh, psych classic psychedelic drugs to kind of, you know, more modern Western consciousness. Those include, um, of course, Albert Hoffman, who, who uh, synthesized LSD, first synthesized it in the in the 30s, but then was thought to have rediscovered it in, in the 40s. And, and then there's Gordon Wasson and his wife who, um, who, who went to Mexico, uh, found Maria Sabina, documented a, a mushroom ceremony, brought mushrooms back to the States, and then uh, wrote uh, an article that was published in Life magazine um, about the the magic mushrooms, and um, there's also there seems to be a, a bit of a, a you know a subterfuge history there, in, insofar as the the CIA was uh, later you know acknowledged to be responsible for having you know spread LSD and 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 uh, provided LSD to to many of the clinicians and, and research labs in the United States who then went on to conduct this research in the 50s and 60s. Um, but it, it, it's, it's important to note that not only were people being treated with mescaline psilocybin and mostly with LSD for all kinds of reasons, uh, to treat mood disorders, to treat psychosis, to try to treat addiction, for palliative care, to treat pain. Uh, this is all within the history of the 50s and 60s and, and, and in papers that you can still pull up today and read. Um, but, uh, but many of these studies were, were uh, conducted without acceptable scientific rigor uh, or, or the, without adequate control conditions or or, or a really you know, careful consideration of study design that we would consider necessary for, for uh, you know, rigorous and, and scientifically valid studies um, uh, today. Um, and certainly without a number of ethical considerations in some cases. Uh, this all came into a crashing halt with, uh, with the passage of the Controlled Substances Act of 1971. And since then, uh, there has been an undercurrent of, of preclinical uh, animal research with psychedelics, but it's only been kind of more recently um, that uh, basic and clinical human research has 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 been revived. Um, so so there's there's your crash course in the in the history of psych, uh, classic psychedelic research. Um, but let's let's kind of move on to a survey of of what what psychedelics do. What do they what do they actually do acutely during the acute effects of psychedelic uh, drug experiences? Um, uh, we can we can appeal to to some of the the kind of perceptual effects, and these are the things that I think people are are most likely to think of when they first hear the word hallucinogen or psychedelic. We're talking about you know elementary hallucinations like uh, uh, visual distortions, uh, like uh, you know walls breathing or the carpet moving when it's not really, or edges being more salient or colors seeming to be more rich and and imbued with kind of vibrance and. and um, or, or kaleidoscopic or geometric or fractal images kind of superimposed on your visual field, uh, phosphine-like visual, visualizations, blobs and light flashes and things like this. And I'd argue these are some of the least interesting uh, acute effects of psychedelic drugs, but you know, these are uh, what people often think of. It's notable that, that certainly not all people who take a psychedelic drug experience these things. We, we, we kind of associate these part and parcel with what happens with psychedelic trips, but, but there, there are a sizable number of people, especially in our controlled research studies, who report not experiencing these things at all. So that's 
kind of an interesting side note. Um, I'm, uh, I'm trained as a cognitive neuroscientist, uh, which means that I, I've, I've been trained to try to come up with uh, clever ways to carefully control uh, behavior and, and, and get people to make behavioral response, responses within the context of some kind of brain imaging uh, measurement so that we can try to, in a way, reverse engineer uh, the interface between the software and the hardware. So how, how does the brain, how does the biology instantiate and, and support and, and control cognitive processes and, and, and psychological processes and, 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 and how does all that work under the hood when we go about the world humaning? Um, so so uh, one of the questions I've always, you know, a series of questions that I've been asking and wanted to ask with psychedelic drugs are what do they do to co cognition? We're thinking about perception, uh, how we see, how we sense, how we feel and smell and hear, um, and 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 decision making and and cognitive control and attention and memory. How are these processes all affected by psychedelics? And it turns out that uh, you know, with most recently with a paper that I published in 2018, but uh, then uh, with psilocybin and then another paper published by colleagues in Switzerland in 2019 with LSD, uh, we showed uh, a number, uh, not surprisingly, uh, a number of dose dependent. Uh, impairments in, in, in specific cognitive functions, um, specifically working in episodic memory, executive function, associative learning, psychomotor performance, like how quickly and accurately do you move your arms and hands and fingers. Um, uh, you know, this shouldn't be surprising, uh, that, but, but, but it's also, it was a little bit surprising to us that, that people were really able to, con to perform uh, these, these cognitive tests during even the highest dose of psilocybin that we've administered with our, within our laboratory, which is a 30 milligram per 70 kilogram dose of psilocybin, which is roughly equivalent to four to five uh, ounces of dried mushrooms, um, which is an, an incredible, it's a substantial dose of, of, of psilocybin, but even then people uh, in this study were able to perform these complex cognitive tasks. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's notable that there are these specific uh, impairments of certain aspects of cognition, but people were still able to function and do these things. Um, this particular task is called the letter end back task. It's a task where you have to, um, you have different conditions and you have to make different responses based on what stimulus appears on the screen. So you'll see a series of, of letters pop up on the screen, X, A, B, Q, Y, Z, Y, X, Q. And in the zero back condition, you have to push a button every time you see an X, that's it. Every time you see an X, you push a button. In the one back condition, you have to press a button when the stimulus you see on screen is the same as the stimulus that just came off screen. So H, X, Y, B, B, then you'd press X, X, then you'd press Y, Y, you'd press B, Q, R, R, you'd press. So that's the one back condition. The two back condition, you have to press the button when the stimulus on screen is the same as the one that came before the one that just came off. Uh, I'm not gonna explain this any further, except that that's a very difficult thing to do uh, when you're sober and, and not experiencing the effects of the psychoactive drug that people were in. The, and, and people got worse at discriminating different stimuli as the dose increased in this two back condition, but they were still able to do the task. Um, so, so, so briefly, what do psychedelics do to cognition? They mildly to moderately impair certain aspects of cognition. What do psychedelics do acutely to affect? Interestingly, and I don't have much on the slide here for this, but, but um, uh, there are a number of studies published uh, in, in the late 2000s and early uh, 2018s um, at various labs, including a number of papers from a lab in Zurich uh, run by Franz Mollenbeiter, suggesting that um, not only uh, do psychedelics uh, kind of impair the processing of negative emotional stimuli, uh, but they also possibly improve the processing of positive emotional stimuli, like happy faces uh, compared to like angry faces, uh, and, 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 and that these are correlated with increases in positive mood. And, and a number of other papers from our lab and around the world have shown acutely that really outside of the context of a bad trip, which we can go into bad trips later if you'd like to, but outside of the context of a bad trip, uh, psychedelic drugs generally kind of increase positive affect and, and can be in, and uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a study that I published uh, last year in 2020, I showed that not only do psychedelics acutely uh, increase positive affect and decrease negative affect, but, but one week after a single high dose of psilocybin, uh, healthy individuals were showing a decrease in negative affect uh, that persisted. Yeah, so this persisted for at least a week after 
their psilocybin experience and a, and, a, and a decrease in what's called the total mood disturbance scale of the profile of mood states. So, so this is a, a summary score of a number of different negative emotional states. Uh, people are showing decreases, transient decreases in negative affect. So, so um, these, these decreases were reflected in self-report measures uh, one week after people's psilocybin session, but we also repeated those measurements one month after the psilocybin session, and negative affect scores tended to kind of creep back up towards baseline. Um, whereas uh, one day before to one week and one month after the that single psilocybin session for healthy individuals, we saw a persisting increase in positive affect. So positive emotions uh, in the dispositional positive emotion scale, joy, content, pride, amusement, awe, but also numerically, not statistically, feelings of love and compassion. Um, so yeah, so just to recap here, we're seeing just after one single dose, high dose of psilocybin in healthy individuals, we're seeing a transient decrease in negative affect, but a persisting increase in positive affect. And interestingly, we, we also did brain imaging uh, measurements of different uh, types. Um, at the same time as we ask people to complete these questionnaires, one day before, one week after, and then one month after a single high dose of psilocybin uh, administered to healthy individuals. And we saw a, a decrease uh, in, in the uh, reactivity of a, of a primitive brain region called the amygdala to negative emotional stimuli that lasted for at least a week, but then rebounded to baseline levels or above one month after. So not only are we seeing these decreases in negative affect reflected in questionnaire measures, but we're seeing biological correlates of this decrease in negative affect. It follows the same pattern. It's transiently decreased for at least a week, but then pops back up in a month later. Um, but also in, in a separate task where people have to discriminate between positive, emotional, positive and negative emotional faces and words, um, we see an increase in the brain activity of two regions, the medial prefrontal cortex and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that are involved in the top-down regulation of emotion. Uh, so we see that at one week after psilocybin, suggesting that there are a number of different mechanisms with the brain, one that kind of controls bottom-up emotional reactivity, another that is involved in top-down control, uh, cognitive control of emotion um, that, that, are, that are kind of... Uh, engaged at one week. We're seeing, uh, so, so a, a, a brief recap here is um, we're seeing uh, transient and decreases in negative emotional experiences, lasting increases in positive affect, and then associated neurobiology that can explain those things. Um, and, and I'll just remind you that these measurements are one week and one month after giving people one single capsule, which is pretty remarkable if you think about that in, in the context of the typical medical model of, of treatment of psychiatric disorders, as well as what we expect out of drug effects uh, for psychoactive substances. Um, there's also a, a whole really interesting thread to follow in terms of the interaction between psychedelic drugs and, and music listening experiences. From, um, from at least the 60s, people really real, really acknowledged, uh, pe people being researchers and clinicians, really acknowledged that uh, there are uh, possibly better and worse approaches to administering psychedelic drugs in a clinical or a research context. And there were some early studies where, where people were given LSD without an explanation of what it was or what it would do to them, left in a room in a hospital for hours on end, and, and it didn't end well for many people, uh, suffice to say. Uh, but but uh, a number of folks, including, uh, I think it's Hans Leuner, um, who was, who was uh, a mentor to Bill Richards, who, who was uh, uh, kind of a, so, someone who was involved in the research in the 60s, but then uh, helped us at the beginning of uh, establishing research at Hopkins and, and is still involved in research at Hopkins and other places. Um, yeah, he, they, they, they really acknowledged and, and began to work with music as, as an adjunct to, to psychedelic drug administration. And, and people can come away from, from psychedelic therapy sessions uh, really, believing in, and expressing that the music was the experience. Um, some folks indicate or, or, or suggest that, that having listened to music uh, during the, uh, the effects of a high dose of, of a psychedelic drug like psilocybin, um, they became one with the music. They, they felt the music at each point. They could understand what the composer was trying to communicate when they wrote that piece of music and, and that the music drove the psychedelic experience. And these all you know, lead to fascinating questions like, well, what the heck is going on in the brain when all of this is happening? How is, how is this reflected in the, in the neural architecture of, of music listening experiences? When I was in grad school at UC Davis, 
most of what I did was uh, use music as a tool to study emotion and memory in the brain. And I worked with computational models of music cognition to try to explore how the brain was representing abstract time varying tonal structure of music. So music doesn't just occur at, at single time points, music evolves over time. And you can think of uh, the evolution of a piece of music over time is really setting up and then violating and fulfilling different expectancies of what notes are going to come next and what chords are going to come next. And we can do this because our brain is tracking the abstract statistical structure of music as, as it's evolving over time. You know, if you play one or two or three chords within a certain key, your brain is going to build a prediction that other chords and notes that fit in that key will come next. And and it's it's by it's by playing with all of these statistical probabilities that the composers throughout time have have been able to build feelings of tension and release and kind of uh, intrigue and 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 all kinds of other you know experiences into the the evolution of the piece of music that they've composed. And 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 briefly, uh, we what my grad school advisor Peter Janata at University of da California Davis had found before I got to him um, was that there are certain brain regions that are involved in tracking this time varying tonal structure. Uh, and, and some of those include the medial prefrontal cortex, which is involved in the default mode network, which is also uh, a network of brain regions that uh, we think is, is, is uniquely targeted by psychedelic drugs. So um, we, uh, we looked at uh, the brain regions that track this time varying tonal structure of music. And we asked the question of whether these brain regions are tracking music more strongly during the effects of LSD compared to placebo. And one of the things we found that was uh, in, in this map, so I'll give you a little kind of uh, crash course in neuroanatomy here. So, so this uh, panel D and panel A, the, this, the regions in the green circle uh, basically cover primary auditory cortex. So this is the part of the brain that's involved in processing sound and tracking sound over time. Uh, and, and, um, and, and there's actually an interesting mix of, of subregions within the basic auditory cortex, some that are, are biased towards much more strongly tracking music uh, and the time varying tonal structure of music during placebo than LSD, but also some regions that are very deeply uh, engaged much more strongly, almost an order of magnitude more strongly during the effects of LSD than during the effects of placebo and tracking the time bearing total structure of music. That's also true within uh, regions of the thalamus, which is kind of like a, a, a switchboard or way station for sensory information in the brain, as well as the angular gyrus, which is involved in orienting yourself in space and time, and the medial prefrontal cortex, which is involved in uh, theory of mind, as well as stitching together memories and emotions, uh, as well as, um, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, pr uh, predicting whether something's going to be rewarding or not. And, and, and all of these, the, the general story coming out of this is that, you know, this architecture underlying the processing of music and this architecture also underlying self-referential processing is, is just like hyper- Hyper tuned during the effects of LSD. This may be one of the reasons that uh, music is is thought to be more salient, more personally meaningful, or, or at least more deeply and richly encoded and experienced uh, during the effects of psychedelic drugs. Um, other studies I've been been involved with have shown that uh, a brain region called the uh, parahippocampal gyrus is more. Uh, which is involved in memory processing is is much more closely connected with uh, uh, visual processing areas that which which might uh, suggest that there you know this is a mechanism or this might be an explanation of why uh, psychedelic drugs uh, may may drive visual you know music with psychedelic drugs may drive visual imagery more closely um, uh, and uh, so 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 yeah that you know I, yeah obviously I, I could spend all day talking just about this uh, but I want to continue on with my kind of broad brush strokes and in, in, in surveying the literature and what people are doing what we're doing um, so we covered what what do psychedelics do acutely what what do they do uh, to perception what do they do to cognition what do they do to affect and what what about psychedelics and music um, but what about what about the effects of psychedelics in 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 populations of individuals who are suffering in various ways? Um, one of the reasons probably a lot of people are coming to the conversation now is because of the potential for psychedelic drugs 
uh, to be therapeutically meaningful and helpful within a variety of mood and substance use disorders. Um, our, our lab uh, published a study in, in 2016 uh, and, and folks at NYU published a parallel study just about the same time showing that psychedelic drug administration to patients who are suffering from depression and anxiety secondary to a life-threatening cancer diagnosis uh, may show precipitous drops in, in depression and anxiety after psilocybin administration. So folks in this study were, uh, once they were enrolled, were randomized, like flipping a coin, to be in either one or another experimental group. The first experimental group got a high dose of psilocybin in, in the first of two uh, experimental sessions. And then in their second of two experimental sessions, they got an incredibly low, basically a subperceptual and non, a non-psychoactive dose of psilocybin. And, and folks randomized to the second group got that trivial non-psychoactive dose of psilocybin first. And then in their second session got the high dose of psilocybin. And we see the red line is the folks who got that high dose first. Then they, their, their depression scores as well as their anxiety scores precipitously drop right after that first session. And after the second session where they get the trivial dose, they stay low and they stay low for at least six months after their psilocybin sessions. Whereas those in the, in the, in the trivial dose first group, they also see a, a, a substantial drop in depression severity and anxiety severity after that first trivial dose of psilocybin. And, and this is important to note because um, when we administer psilocybin to people within research and therapeutic contexts, we don't just give them the drug and then walk away. We, we go through an awful lot of really careful screening of people to make sure it's medically and psychiatrically healthy or, or, or not obviously dangerous for us to administer the drugs to this individual. Uh, but then we also go through a period of preparation that involves a lot of unstructured psychotherapy in which we really get to know the person. We build a lot of real strong and deep trust and rapport with people. And then we administer psilocybin. And, and then during the drug, exp the, the drug session, we, we, we carefully monitor them uh, and, we, and we give them a lot of reassurance uh, and, and we sit in non-judgmental presence with these people. Um, uh, for, for the entire day. And then afterwards, we debrief, uh, we, we kind of reckon, try to reconcile the experience with the person's life. We call this integration. And then there's ongoing follow-up afterwards. So there's a whole lot going on here. And, and, and briefly, this, you know, this blue line for after the first session, I would argue, uh, at the very least, suggests that you know, there's, there's certainly a non-pharmacological effect. This, this, this represents the effect of the package within which the container within which we administer psilocybin, which is certainly non-trivial. Um, but even then, it's not nearly half the effect, uh, or it's about half the effect of, of the entire package. And then once people do receive psilocybin in their second session, they come straight down to where everybody else was, and they all continue on. Uh, but, but, but it's also important to note that this is a, a, a study within the context of people who have depression and anxiety secondary to a life-threatening cancer diagnosis. Um, other people will interpret that as kind of reactionary or, you know, uh, adjustment disorder. Uh, it's very different than, than the depression that someone experiences uh, more organically, um, not related to something like being diagnosed with cancer. Um, in, in a study that we just published at the end of last year in JAMA Psychiatry, uh, we showed similar uh, impressive reductions in, in depression severity in patients with just more generally described uh, and diagnosed major depressive disorder. Um, and then this is also similar to an open label trial that was published in Imperial College, by Imperial College London uh, in pa with patients, uh, in patients with uh, uh, with treatment resistant depression. And also I don't have a slide on this, but it, it, we, we need to acknowledge the amazing paper that Imperial College London published, I think just last week, uh, showing that um, compared to a six week course of escitalopram, which is one of the kind of classic and standard SSRI treatments for depression, uh, psilocybin at the very least was not inferior to escitalopram, but, but there are many measures, secondary outcome measures in that paper where, where they showed a clear um, benefit of psilocybin over escitalopram. Um, we're showing these effects in patients with mood disorders, but uh, my colleague, Matt Johnson and Al Garcia um, are, are published a, an open label pilot study showing um, in 2014, showing a similarly impressive effect of psilocybin in helping people to quit smoking, which was bi biologically verified for longer than a year after their psilocybin sessions, which were paired with a target quit date. Uh, our colleague at NYU, Mike Bogenschutz, is showing some similarly impressive effects of psilocybin therapy on drinking in patients with alcohol use disorder. Um, 
and uh, and this comports with uh, a, a meta analysis conducted by Krebs and Johansson of the older literature from the uh, 60s and 70s uh, in, in for using LSD to treat uh, alcohol use disorder, and and in the small number of studies that they found that were, were, were met the bar for being rigorous and acceptable for modern research, they found an, a, an overall effect in the meta analysis favoring LSD for the treatment of alcohol use disorder. Um, uh, it, it's it's um, it's it's it goes without saying that these are very powerful drugs and and we're, we're we're observing all of these effects within carefully controlled experimental uh, environments where we where we have uh, a lot of power in observing and and then responding to medical emergencies if they occur they almost never occur um, and and n n we haven't encountered anybody who's had any persisting. Uh, deleterious effects of psychedelic drugs, which in and of itself is really uh, remarkable. But but this isn't to say that these drugs aren't powerful. They're very powerful drugs, and it's not to say that they're going to work for everybody and they should be administered to everybody. That's absolutely not the case. And we very carefully screen out people, uh, especially people with certain cardiac or, or psychiatric comorbidities that that we we think it may be very dangerous to administer drugs to these people, um, these these compounds. Um, but within those caveats, these compounds and, and the therapeutic models around which uh, or within which they're administered may represent really powerful therapeutics uh, for a number of folks who who are really suffering and, and for whom standard therapies may or may not work. Um, I'll, I'll I'll just briefly go through some some theories on how psychedelics may do all of these things. Um, uh, people have focused a lot on on what we can consider broadly as a peak experience with psychedelic drugs. Uh, we've operationalized these peak experiences as mystical experiences, following models that have been built uh, by uh, you know starting with William James at least. Uh, with uh, the varieties of uh, religious experiences. He has a whole chapter on mystical experiences where he begins to build the case that these experiences are, are kind of defined by um, primarily by an experience of unity or a feeling of unity with self, with others, with all things. Uh, Walter Stace was, was a, a philosopher of religion who built upon and expounded and, and, and expanded upon that model. And, 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 and the mystical experience kind of operational definition is, is, is largely based on this, um, but, uh, but an, another kind of operationalization of, of this peak experience, which, which is, is favored by, by a number of folks in Europe is this ego dissolution idea, um, first introduced by Dietrich, uh, who, who tried to create this five dimensional altered state of conscious questionnaire that he hoped would be sensitive to all forms of altered states of consciousness, to, no matter the ideology, whether they were, uh, drug-induced or induced from exercise or sensory deprivation or meditation. Um, uh, and and, and our, our colleagues at Imperial College kind of built upon this idea of ego dissolution uh, and, and, and they now have an ego dissolution inventory. Frankly, all of these questionnaires are very highly correlated um, and it, it's, it's unclear whether the, the real um, subtleties of the differences between these scales will ultimately matter. But uh, suffice to say, we've demonstrated that Mystical experiences follow a, care, uh, a clean and orderly dose-dependent response, such that, such that the higher dose of psilocybin you minister, the more likely people are to have a stronger mystical experience. Um, and, and strength of mystical experience has been correlated with retrospective ratings of the meaningfulness of the experience, the spiritual significance of the experience. And, and let me just note that, that some people coming out of high dose psilocybin sessions in carefully controlled environments in our laboratory are, are rating these experiences as among the top five most meaningful or the single most meaningful experience of their life among the top five most spiritually significant or the single most spiritually significant experience of their life that alone is remarkable but uh, and 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 strength of mystical experience is correlated with these ratings but strength of mystical experience is also correlated with uh, the degree of reduction of depression and anxiety in our patients uh, with cancer um, and also uh, is correlated with change in craving, change in confidence to abstain, and change in the temptation to smoke in, in Matt and Al's uh, smoking study. So uh, that's, that's fascinating that, that this measure of, of a peak experience could in any way be correlated with uh, the therapeutic outcomes 
that people encounter. Um, another, another. Uh, so, so, so it could be that there's something unique about this peak experience that drives or facilitates or helps people to maintain a change in their life where they were not able to find that change before. Um, it could also be that there are other mechanisms at play. So, so in in our in our weightless control depression study that we recently published in JAMA Psychiatry, we also had people. Um, complete. Well, actually, let me let me skip ahead to this first, and I'll come back to that other slide. Um, it may be that, that mystical experiences uh, predict changes in depression, but but my colleague Alan Davis uh, has been hard at work trying to really characterize insights that people can gain during these experiences, and had the hypothesis that insights and not mystical experiences were what actually was driving you know therapeutic change. Uh, in, a, in a large survey study that we conducted, uh, Alan and I and Roland. Um, actually demonstrated that it's not acute mystical effects and it's not actually directly uh, insights, but it's insights that people gain during these experiences that are predicting later increases in psychological flexibility. And these psychological flexibility increases are what more directly predict changes in depression and anxiety after a psychedelic experience. So, so it may actually be that changes in psychological flexibility uh, are, are what are underlying these therapeutic effects. So both mood and substance use disorders can be characterized as disorders of limited behavioral repertoire. You get stuck in a rut or a pattern that's maladaptive or, or really, really kind of toxic for you um, and, uh, and everybody around you. And somehow, I don't know if you lost my screen. I lost my screen for a second there. Sorry. Um, but, 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 but there's something about the psychedelic experience that allows you to increase psychological flexibility and the flexibility allows you to kind of crawl out of these ruts or these behavioral loops or these neurological loops that keep you stuck in toxic or maladaptive states. Um, so it may be this psychological flexibility. We came at the idea with a slightly different uh, approach in, in using a, a game that uh, is not unlike the Wisconsin card sort test, if, if you're familiar with that. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a game where you're given uh, four stimuli in the screen and you're told to click on the object that doesn't belong. And you look at that and you're like, oh, it's easy. It's the star. Oh, wait, is it the star? Well, the star is a different shape. So the star is not a triangle. These three are, so that does, but, 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 you know, it's also larger than these. So, so maybe it really is a star, but maybe it's line weight. You know, this one's different than the other three because the other three have small line weight and this has kind of thick line weight. So, so part of the test is figuring out what the rule is. And then once you figure out what the rule is, you can respond using that rule. But after a certain number of correct responses, the rule changes on you without you knowing. So you have to figure out that the rule changed. And then you have to figure out what the new rule is. And then once you respond with that new rule a certain number of times, the rule changes again. And then you're like, oh, crap, now I have to figure out the new rule. And th this is used as a measure of cognitive flexibility. The measure of cognitive flexibility is actually something called perseverative errors. So once you learn a rule and the rule changes, how long do you perseverate on the old rule before you explore and then go find the new rule? Uh, that, that number of perseverative errors, the greater the perseverative errors, the less cognitive flexibility you're thought to have. This is just one measure of cognitive flexibility. There are lots of ways to conceptualize and operationalize cognitive flexibility, but with this one operationalization we showed um, in our in our depression study half the people in, the, in our depression study were uh, randomized to have immediate treatment with psilocybin the other half were randomized to wait eight weeks before they started their treatment for psilocybin and eight weeks is just about how long it took for the first immediate treatment group to get to the four week post psilocybin time point so so um those who received psilocybin first immediately saw a drop in their perseverative errors, which we interpret as an increase in cognitive flexibility. Those who did not get psilocybin first stayed uh, at that high level of perseverative errors. And once they got psilocybin, they dropped down to the level of perseverative errors that that immediate treatment group uh, had once they received psilocybin. So we're seeing a decrease in an increase, a decrease in perseverative errors and an increase in cognitive flexibility, which may align in some ways with psychological flexibility. Um, so it may be that there's this kind of flexibility aspect that's underlying the therapeutic effects of psychedelic drugs. Um, I want to I want to skip ahead a little bit uh, because I realize I'm supposed to give a 30 minute talk and we're already way ahead of that. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me. Um, uh, there there are a couple of other ideas, but but this all kind of uh, fits in with. Uh, the sense uh, that we're getting from um, from uh, recent preclinical research suggesting that on a molecular level, psychedelic drugs may 
uh, be what people call psychoplastogens. They increase neurite growth, which are small projections off of neurons that can or cannot grow into uh, new spines and synapses, but they see increases in spine density, density, synaptogenesis. Essentially, neurons are growing new connections after psychedelic drug administration, and it's these new connections that may underlie the cognitive and neural flexibility and the, and the psych, uh, psychological flexibility that we're observing um, that, that are predicting the increases in, in uh, uh, or decreases in depression and anxiety. Um, all, so all of this is, is, is really fascinating, and, and, and there are a couple of things we didn't cover, such as uh, you know, theories of, of the acute neural effects of psychedelic drugs. Uh, there's one theory out there that, um, that mystical experiences or ego dissolution experiences are actually uh, a, a function of decreases in the activity and connectivity of something called the default mode network. This is a network of brain regions that are involved in self-referential processing, orienting the self in space and time, autobiographical memories. Um, that could be the case, or it could be the case that decreases in default mode network activity and connectivity are an artifact of the experience that aren't necessarily exactly what leads to ego dissolution. So to put it in a broader context, these default mode network uh, in the brain is, is a network that was found to kind of turn on when we're not attending to stuff outside or having to respond to things. Um, but once we have to do something like, which think of it as a task positive activity, once we have to do something out there in the world, respond to a stimulus, process incoming information, our default mode network turns off and all of these other task positive attention and memory and executive control networks, they turn on. Um, and that's a general property of, of, of these brain networks that's broadly understood and, and, and it's, it's not a perfect anti-correlation, but generally speaking, when we have to attend to stuff out there and do things, um, our default mode network turns off and these task positive networks turn on. But when we turn inward or we rest or we're told to just sit there, close your eyes for a moment and do, do anything, our default mode network comes on and our task positive networks turn off. And it's possible that instead of directly driving ego, ego dissolution, this reduction in default mode network activity could be a product of your brain having to cycle through different task positive cognitive states to address all the crazy stuff that's happening during the psychedelic experience. All of the visual visualizations that you're experiencing, all of the tactile information that's coming into your body, all of the thoughts you've had and, and, and the kind of projection and, 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 and thinking about your, your past, maybe, maybe not. It, it might be that the default mode network looks like it's turning off because your brain is cycling through all of these different cognitive states more rapidly during a psilocybin experience. Another theory of the acute effects of psychedelic drugs stems from a theory of the neurobiology of psychosis, which suggests that the thalamus, which I briefly touched upon a little earlier, uh, the thalamus is 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 like a way station. It's like a, a filter for sensory information, and and it and it it almost like puts up a gate and only opens that gate for certain parts of sensory information to then get passed on to the cortex uh, to then the rest of your brain to be processed and attended to. Um, and some theories of psychosis suggest that uh, some aspects of psychosis are actually due to an, uh, a failure of thalamic gating. So the thalamus is letting too much sensory information through, and that is either leading to uh, you know some aspects of hallucination or delusion, or it's uh, in a, in a way short circuiting some of the prefrontal and cortical areas that are receiving this information. They're receiving too much; they can't handle it, and that throws everything off and leads to all, all many of the aspects of, of schizophrenia and psychosis that that um, that are hallmarks of those disorders. So that that's that that was one theory that, that was kind of. Uh, tagged onto and, and, and brought forward within psychedelic research, partly due to the uh, potential for psychedelics, at least early on in the 60, 50s and 60s, uh, to be models of psychosis. People looked at the effects of LSD and thought, oh, that kind of looks like psychosis. Maybe this drug could be a great model of psychosis. Maybe we could administer the drug to healthy people in a reversible fashion. They'll be better when it's over. But while they're under this acute state, we can have a much greater insight into psychotic process and then learn a lot more about psychotic disorders. At one point, I think Humphrey Osmond himself even thought, wouldn't LSD be an interesting tool for medical trainees, for people who are being trained in psychiatry? We should administer them LSD so that they know what psychosis is like, so they'll be better prepared to treat their patients. None of that really panned out. It turns out that psychedelics are not great models of psychosis. There are far better drug models for psychosis, like the amphetamine model of psychosis. But uh, suffice it to say, the idea that 
there might be a, some synergy between effects of psychedelic drugs in the brain and models of psychosis in the brain stuck. And this model actually does, you know, have a lot of sense. Uh, and 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 the model suggests that psychedelic drugs kind of either directly inhibit thalamic gating of sensory stimuli, so it either changes the way that the thalamus uh, allows sensory stimuli through. So so psychedelics may directly kind of open the gates of the thalamus, or psychedelics may uh, impair the ability of higher level cortical regions to control the thalamus. So it's almost like you you, you take away the control aspect, uh, the top-down control of the thalamus, and then the thalamus floods the cortex with sensory information, which further impairs the cortical region's ability to exert top-down control over the thalamus, which leads to this loop and this cascade of events and effects that leads to all of the sensory disturbances and, and the lack of cognitive control and all the other things that we experience acutely with psychedelic drugs. And, and very briefly, there's now some evidence from, from Katrin Preller, um, who, who's a, a, a scientist at the University of Zurich and also Yale University, uh, suggesting that you know, acutely she's shown uh, some evidence that uh, thalamic connectivity with sensory regions is greatly increased. Th thalamus to visual brain regions, thalamus to auditory brain regions, and also thalamus to somatosensory brain regions is greatly increased during the effects um, of LSD and psilocybin. And finally, uh, the, the claustrum is a, a brain region that is one of the most High, densely interconnected brain regions uh, to all other areas of the cortex. It's not cortical. It's a, a subcortical structure, a thin strip of gray matter tucked in between uh, some some basal ganglion regions and internal and external capsule. And uh, this this brain region uh, was was unique in in its hyperconnectivity with all other regions of the cortex, and and so much so that. Uh, uh, Francis Crick of DNA fame uh, in his final uh, scientific uh, paper uh, co-written co with Christoph Koch, they, they both looked at this claustrum region. They said, okay, well, it's, it's connected. It's bi-directionally connected with almost every other region of the brain. If there were to be a brain region that was responsible for stitching together uh, the continuous percept uh, of, of, of multisensory information, thoughts, and decisions that we all experience, uh, as awake and living beings, you know, if, if there was one brain region that was responsible for stitching together the conscious percept, the claustrum is perfectly positioned to be that brain region. And 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 if you haven't read that paper, you should go and read it. It's really interesting. I think they're wrong, and I think we figured that out more recently. Um, if, if 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 such a brain region were to exist, and if such a brain region were responsible for stitching together conscious percepts, uh, you'd expect this brain region to be continuously active in awake and behaving mammals, and it just turns out to not be the case. It's it's very uh, seldom active. And, and very transiently active. And in, 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 a, in a paper that I, I published uh, with colleagues at the University of Maryland, uh, we, we developed um, a method for analyzing human brain imaging data to try to interrogate claustrum activity and functional connectivity. And we found that the claustrum was really only active at the onset of really challenging blocks of tasks. And, and, and we're building a, a theory that the claustrum is actually involved in coordinating uh, the, the, the organization of, of brain networks. So when you're doing one thing, your brain, your brain may be in a certain network state to, 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 to efficiently respond to that thing that you're doing. But when you have to switch tasks and do something else, especially if it's a much more challenging thing, then you, the claustrum will come online briefly to reset and reorganize the brain uh, network state so that it can so that it can respond to this other task. Um, the claustrum is also a unique brain structure in so far as it uh, is one of the brain regions that most densely expresses serotonin 2A receptors that are the target of classic psychedelic drugs. They also really densely express kappa opioid receptors, which are the target of atypical hallucinogens like salvinorin A. And um, just briefly, we've We've shown uh, in a paper published last year that uh, psilocybin greatly reduces claustrum connectivity to task control networks, as well as the default mode network and auditory networks. Uh, we also showed that this uh, connectivity of the claustrum to default mode and task control networks was correlated with the integrity of those networks. So essentially, 
the less claustrum connectivity to these networks, the more these networks fell apart under the effects of psychedelic drugs. And I don't have a slide on it, but we're briefly showing some similar effects with salvinorin A, which is a completely different mechanistic drug uh, that has hallucinogen-like properties. So we're we're starting to dig into whether these effects are unique to classic hallucinogens or not. Um, and and sorry, I've went way over time, but but I just want to kind of ask a question about consciousness now, uh, which is probably why maybe maybe why a lot of you came. Um, lots of people have made promises about psychedelics, uh, specifically that psychedelics will teach us something about consciousness or even teach us something that we don't already understand about the brain or about the psychological processing. And, and I, I guess I want to throw just a little bit of cold water on that. I want to ask us to be a little more precise in what we think we mean when we say, when we use the C word. Um, we can, we can, we can at, a, at a very high level, we can think about hard versus easy problems of consciousness, right? And, and the hard pro the classic hard problem of consciousness is roughly, you know, how can this subjective experience arise from matter? How can this felt sense of being exist where where does it why how what is it and 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 why would it ever arise from a biological process i frankly don't and 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 i don't believe any of my colleagues uh, i uh, would say that they do think that psychedelics are going to crack that nut um I, I think that you know what psychedelics are, are are more likely to be able to be useful for is as a tool to try to get better resolution or deeper insights into what may be the easier problems of consciousness, like what are the contents of consciousness and how does the brain represent the contents of consciousness and and what's accessible to conscious awareness and how does that affect conscious processing and, and psychological processing and neurological brain. I think these are all well within striking range for psychedelic drugs, but I also think they're also well within the range of other methods and approaches and tools and manipulations and that we can use to interrogate these processes that we have within the palette of, of, of tools and, 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 and instruments within neuroscience, psychiatry, and psychology. Um, and, and when you say it that way, it makes psychedelics sound not so special. And I guess I guess, I, yeah, I kind of agree with that in a way. I think that it's very likely that psychedelics are, are much more powerful interventions than we typically have at our disposal. And for that reason alone are incredibly important. I do think we're gonna learn some new things about the brain. I just don't think it's really quite happened yet. Um, and and, and, and I, I, I don't think there's any reason to think that we're gonna crack the hard problem of consciousness. What I, what I honestly think is that when people say psychedelics are gonna teach us something about consciousness, I think when people are using that word consciousness in that context, sometimes they're kind of low key relating their own experiences. Like I think it's possible that psychedelics can and, and maybe have certainly, um, maybe certainly, uh, uh, given individuals insights into their own aspects of consciousness that they weren't previously aware of. I'm totally on board with that. And I think that might be what people mean often when they say that psychedelics are going to teach us something about consciousness. Um, so, so in a way, I completely disagree. And in a way, I totally agree. It all depends on what we mean when we use that tricky C word. Um, but uh, I've, I've, I've spent plenty of your time. Um, I'm really grateful uh, for your attention. And, and I'd, I'd like to, you know, just, yeah talk about whatever it is you, you'd like to talk about in this space. Awesome, well, thank you so much, Dr. Barrett. Um, super interesting to hear about all the work you've been doing, all the studies you've been involved with, and I feel like we all got a crash course in psychedelic research. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Fidel um, Zaiden, I hope I pronounced that correctly. There are several questions in the chat, so um, I'm hoping he can lead a, a discussion for us. Thanks. Hey, Nicole, Fred, that was, hey, man, that was freaking hey. killer talk. Awesome. Thanks, wow. man. It's, it's good to see you. It's really, yeah, it's great. It's great to share at least some cyberspace uh with, with you um and you guys congratulations on the new center i don't know if you've i don't know I, I missed the introduction but you guys landed what like 20 million dollars to start the best well okay 17.86 cool, cool 17 yeah. okay 17.86 million dollars or something crazy yeah. 
to start the first of its kind psychedelic research center. And it happens to be at a flagship program like Johns Hopkins and Fred is right in the center of it all, as you can see it. So, and he's a super humble dude too. So I just want to give you good kudos for being pioneers and uh, we're just following you guys' trail that you've blazed. So, <clears throat> so well, I, well, I yeah, thanks. go ahead. And and yeah, no, no, thanks. Thank you so much. It's, it's incredibly kind of you. And and, and uh, I don't I don't want to uh, at all diminish from 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 the huge milestone that you all have experienced recently, and and being able to establish at least a name, right? But I but have you have you gotten funding yet for 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 psychedelic research at UCSD? We we received uh, one point seven or something to do uh, psilocybin brain imaging for phantom limb pain. And we're using that's, that's amazing model. <laughs> we just cut and paste. Well, what what better place to do it? Uh, yeah, and and then that's nothing. That's nothing to, to to be shy about. That's an incredible uh, achievement. So I'm, I'm grateful for you guys, and I can't wait to see what what you guys do. Cheers, man! It's a dream come true. Um, so so without any further ado, I think what I'm reading from from the queue uh, in the chat is there's a, there's a heavy heavy interest in 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 microdosing microdosing in enhancing awareness, microdosing and facilitating performance mentally, physically, metaphysically. Um, can you speak to what you would consider a the appropriate dosage for what is quote unquote a microdose, how, what you know of it, what it is particularly effective for, can it access or change context of consciousness and so on? Yeah, no, that's, that's excellent, timely, provocative, and, uh, and 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 please uh, bear with me and, and and be kind in my response because um, if hey, so so yeah side note I I my my computer really actually took a it died a couple of days ago and I'm on a brand new computer and I haven't actually transferred everything over to my new computer I I would honestly take a moment to walk you through the recent uh, empirical evidence uh, for or against microdosing um, but but you'll just have to take my word for it and then go look at some papers. Um, all of the studies that have been published to date on microdosing suggest a big fat whopping nothing burger. They're, 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 the, I believe that the only actual empirical evidence for an effect of microdosing is a slight deficit in, in, in detecting emotional faces suggested by, I, th I think it was uh, out of Harriet DeWitt's lab at University of Chicago, but just about everything else is, has shown a whopping no effect of microdosing on anything. Um, uh, there, was a, there was a paper published uh, by Neil Four family and the folks at Eleusis, um, and, and it was really clever marketing, and I, I had given props for it. They, the paper was, was basically shown as, you know, no risk of microdosing in, in healthy populations, and the no risk is actually more accurately interpreted as no effects at all. There could be no risk because nothing at all happened. They, in their paper, published and reported on a very small segment of the massive battery of assessments that they levied in this in this rather well-powered study, if you ask me. Um, and and they found absolutely nothing. Uh, the, the Neil Ford, I, I, she's a wonderful person and, and she's a great scientist. And, and she presented these data at the first meeting of the International Society for Research in Psychedelics, which was I think 2019 in New Orleans, and wow, we, what we didn't predict from 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 that point forward. But um, yeah, yeah, she she was very open about nothing, nothing at all happened, you know, having having been found. And and so so can, can I recommend a, a, an appropriate dose of microdosing? Absolutely not, for a couple of reasons. One, you know, I I I can't recommend that you go out and take uh, you know illegal drugs. Uh, uh, so for whatever I say, I'm just you know be, being. Uh, uh, on uh, honest in 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 protecting my it's, my own it's job illegal security in here. some places in the states it's not so it's it's federally it's federally <laughs> illegal so right. if you find federally. yourself in a context that's right if you find yourself in a context where where it's legal to take uh you know a, a psychedelic drug uh then by all means microdose because we don't think there's any reason to think it'll hurt you it probably won't help you either uh at least with this the empirical evidence that we have what, what, what was interesting uh, most recently was the paper published uh, by Imperial College London, uh, a citizen science paper where they where they kind of gave people instructions on how to self blind and and do and do a self blinded study of microdosing, which I thought was fascinating. And 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 they had people complete a number of different outcome measures along the way, and and the outcome of that study was that um, placebo uh, doses seemed to be 
uh, just as effective in 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 in, in um, meeting any, mediating outcomes as, as as what we think they were administering with microdoses, and and I, I think that overall the whole thing uh, really sounds and feels and smells like a huge placebo effect, and 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 I, I want I want to just you know be a little humble here because I know people. Uh, you know, if if you've ever heard the name James Fadiman, he has made it his mission over the past, you know, at least five or ten years to go around the world collecting stories of people who swear by and 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 are completely convinced by their benefits of psychedo uh, of microdosing psychedelics. And and uh, I also I also realize that I'm being rather you know aggressive in in in, in pouring cold water on this thing. And I I uh, that that's completely unfair to, of of me in, in a way because. There are people who were completely convinced of, of the benefits that they've experienced from microdosing. I just have to say that the scientific evidence right now doesn't support it. And, and it might be possible, and it might be possible that the tests that people are using aren't sensitive enough to the effects that microdosing does have, or or that we're not looking at the right clinical populations to understand the effects of microdosing in those clinical populations. All those things may be true. And if I've offended you by saying this, if you believe you've been helped by microdosing, I did I didn't say this out of any anger or angst or, or or personal vindictiveness. I just we don't have any evidence yet. That's right. And you're a scientist and you have to speak just like you spoke all, all this hour about the evidence. And, you, and you, it's not fair for you to go outside of the evidence now because it's a different question. So I think it's a fair answer, yeah. a legitimate one. And so it leads me to a bridge question that asks, do you need the psychoactive experience for the benefit? Or can you just inject me with a shit ton of psilocybin and then put me to sleep on propofol and would 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 I still have the benefit? Yeah, man, uh, that, this is these are the there there are actually you know I'll say this is a billion dollar question. There are like actual market valuations of companies uh, that the the the, 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 the yeah there, there's there's an actual market value to this question. Um, briefly. Um, I think most in our lab would say, yeah, the, this, the experience is, is part of the medicine. And uh, a number of other folks are, are spending an awful lot of money, time, and effort trying to figure out if they can come up with compounds that are non-psychedelic psychedelics that do the same thing. And, uh, you know, I, ho I hope this doesn't sound like a cop-out, but we don't know yet. And I'd be very happy for the answer to be you don't need the psychedelic experience. But the reason being that um, I can tell you from personal experience, having run now multiple studies uh, with, with psychedelic drugs, and I'm not even talking about the, the headache of the DEA and the FDA and the IRB regulations and stuff like that, um, which is, you know, I, I just, I just, just last week enrolled my first person in a, in a large multi, uh, clinical trial in patients with major depressive disorder and co-occurring alcohol use disorder. That was, the middle of April, and I, I, I made my first uh, regulatory submission in February of 2020. So that's how long it takes uh, the flagship university in the United States to get a study off the ground. Um, uh, needless to say, that's a lot of work. I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about once you get someone into the study and you do preparation and then and the psychedelic administration the integration, it's a lot of work. And people go through life-changing experiences. And um, you know, it's it's part part that that's part of why we think the experience is part of the medicine. I can't explain to you how you would get from point A to point B in a patient who's been depressed for for two decades, and then you know all of a sudden the day after the psilocybin experience is is scoring in negligibly on depression severity indexes. They're rated by cl blinded clinicians over a telephone with like the least amount of bias possible. I don't know how you get to point A to point from point A to point B there without the story and, and the entire experience of them reliving their trauma and then coming to terms with it. And I don't, I don't know how that works, but if it did work, this would make the drug far more accessible to the world because the logistics and the cost of, of, of delivering this in a, in a real scalable therapeutic context are it's just, it's, 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 it's kind of, Pithy to say it's not trivial. It's it's a huge burden and barrier, and then it will be a barrier to delivering these things. So I'd love the answer to be you don't need the psychedelic experience, but I also don't believe that's going to be the case. And also, there, there's a, you know some some of the context on some of the comments on Twitter have been like, why are you scared of this? 
why do you want to get rid of the psychedelic experience? What's wrong with that? Isn't aren't we aren't we going through some kind of patholo patho pathologization? I'm uh, sorry, you know the word I'm trying to I think you're going, um, on the right path. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Why are we why are we pathologizing this experience? Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. Um sorry, I, I'm talking a lot. <laughs> no, you're good, dude. No, this is good. This is good. And I think I think that's a great answer because actually we don't we don't actually know. And I would agree with you too that the experience is critical to some of the traumas, especially with a hero dose, some of the doses that are being elicited in the laboratory setting. There is a lot of uh, ego loss there, right? I mean, you talked a lot about this is ego dissolution. So this brings up this notion of um this of course i don't i agree with you psilocybin or psychedelic research isn't going to get closer to solving the hard problem but doesn't it inform a lot more than just contents of consciousness you have people that are on their deathbed and they're no longer afraid of dying and that's not just because you know their mind isn't wandering as much anymore it's not like a benzo effect something else happened so is it possible the psychedelics at that dose do something about our overarching elephant in the room, which is, holy shit, we're going to die at some point. And I don't know. Is that consciousness? <laughs> well, I think it's awareness. And, and okay. it gets to your point of defining what consciousness is, that C word is critical. I am a simplest and a reductionist, and I'll just call it awareness. Well, I, I don't. I don't think that anything you said is at all in conflict with anything that I said. I see. I see the the the, the scenario you just mapped out as is precisely making an individual more aware of aspects of their consciousness that they were not previously aware of. I, I fully buy into that, and 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 maybe I either misinterpreted what you said, or I'm I'm, I'm playing a straw man here. But uh, and if either of those are true, let me know. But 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 uh, you know, I I, I think that might be the therapy i think that might be the key to all of this but but it's not like teaching us something scientific about the structure or the nature of consciousness it's it's allowing someone access to a deeper level of their own consciousness which is not to be trivialized either i mean but maybe maybe that's the and and so okay so how can you do that with with a pill that doesn't have a psychedelic effect i don't know well i don't know either um, I mean, we could talk about that. There are other self experiences that we can have that resemble the truth and awareness that arise from, I mean, not as in such a concentrated, intense space I read about. Um, so I think, um, that's interesting. I do want to, I do want to see if we can get a little bit more of these questions and I, that are in the chat. Um, and one from Jonathan asks about the role of psychedelics and TBI, traumatic brain injuries. Um, and what about folks, um, you know, uh, is there any evidence for folks that, that have post-concussive headaches or comorbidities that psychedelics, I mean, obviously there's a relationship with addiction there, right? That we, we do know is clear, but maybe we yeah. What about trauma, physical trauma, emotional trauma? Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, yeah. The, tra the trauma itself. I, uh, I was recently at a, at a, at a symposium where um, oh, there were a couple of people. One was, uh, she's a therapist who works for field trip now. And, and another was, um, Oh my God, why am I forgetting her name? I'm, I'm, I'm just historically bad with names. So this is not a, a, any, any judgment on the person who worked with Charlie Grobe and she's a wonderful therapist and she does MDMA research with uh, persons on the autism spectrum. Um, who is this? Who am I talking about? Well, anyway, I, I, I'll, it'll come to me and I'm so sorry for uh, the person who I'm forgetting her name. Um, they, 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 they said, um, you know, the number of people that, that cross their therapeutic path uh, with any variety of, of uh, issues or illnesses that they're suffering from, you know, it's, it's, it's immeasurable how many of these individuals are really at the root of all of it is trauma. 
psychological trauma or emotional trauma, leading to depression, leading to anxiety, leading leading to some other you know manifestation or PTSD uh, more directly. But you know, uh, it's it's like all you know, so much of it is trauma that you know all of it should be just reclassified as trauma, and we should all be trauma informed. Um, and a lot of trauma emerges within psychedelic therapy sessions because a lot of trauma is kind of repressed and and then becomes a core of something that you don't know is there. Um, yeah, I, th I, th I think I think the angle on psychedelics treating emotional and psychological trauma is almost indisputable. I mean, maybe I shouldn't say it in such clear terms, but I, I guess I did. Um, uh, but physical trauma and, 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 and kind of insults to the brain or the central nervous system and things like that are a different thing. And this is this is a lot more of what I think you all are going to get into with with, you know, phantom limb pain. And and, 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 and it, it, maybe it's in the realm of possibility. Let me digress for just a moment and, and talk about the work that um, Chuck Nichols is doing at LSU. Uh, looking at the potential anti-inflammatory properties of psychedelic drugs, I think he's he's building a really nice and, and kind of rich and, and, and rigorous body of research suggesting that psychedelics have uh, anti-inflammatory processes uh, properties at at very low doses. So, okay, taking a step back a second too, if microdosing does do anything, my bet is that it would be anti-inflammatory mediated. Stepping off my soapbox. Back to the question: it, 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 If 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 psychedelics are anti-inflammatory agents, that that alone could open the door of psychedelic therapeutic properties for any number of things. Like almost everything is inflammation, right? But also, inflammatory processes are are, are involved in kind of inhibiting or at least mediating recovery from kind of physical injury and recovery from neural injury. If you can kind of short circuit that process, remove the inflammation, you allow everything else to work better. BDNF comes online, and tour insert all of the other fancy acronyms. Um, but but also in, in TBI, so so there's there's some interesting, there are interesting anecdotes out there. And, and it's interesting that this entire field is so motivated by anecdotes, but, but there are anecdotes of, of, of uh, MMA fighters who, who after, you know, years in the octagon or the ring or whatever uh, are obviously slurring their speech and they have attention problems and memory problems. And, and they're, they're showing clear signs of acquired brain injury. And then their story is, and I'm not, doubting the story. I'm just saying that, you know, this is what they say happened. They will go in, into a number of ayahuasca retreats or they'll go through microdosing and macrodosing regimens and out the other side, they seem to have recovered. What could possibly explain that? Well, I, I, a lot of people think that it's a bit of an ask to believe that psychedelics are leading to the repair of the brain regions that were injured, you know, if you have a lesion in your brain, is are psychedelics really going to repair that? Are they going to regrow the, all of the structures that had a complex kind of developmental history? My guess is no, but we don't need that to be the answer anyway. Um, you know, a lot of recovery from brain trauma is, is, is relearning how to do whatever it is you lost the ability to do by repurposing different brain regions to do those things. And, and the brain is incredibly plastic and capable of doing this. This is why many people from trauma can re recover from that trauma. And it, I think it's equally possible that if, if psychedelics truly have a neuropsychoplastogenic property, if they have this kind of synaptic uh, neurogenic, kind of neurogenic, but kind of not neurogenic property. Um, another side note, there, there was a, uh, an animal, uh, a rodent paper that was published a couple of years ago that suggested that psychedelics increase hippocampal neurogenesis. So regrowth of new neurons in the hippocampus, which, was, which is involved in memory, but also like so many other things that we do. Um, that was really groundbreaking. I, I have it on good faith from, from people whose opinions I really trust that uh, there are some kind of methodological problems with that paper, so maybe we shouldn't put so much weight behind it. But um, suffice to say, it, it, I, I think maybe on a small scale, if psychedelics can help us regrow neurons, regrow synapses, that might be helpful in the brain more efficiently restructuring around an injury. But I find it hard to believe that psychedelics could truly like completely repair large lesions or insults in the brain. Yeah, I would I would agree with you on that on that too, Fred. Um, and um, I, I have just a, a, one comment, maybe two quick questions, and then a big question, and then we'll. I know it's ten twenty over where you are, and we'll we'll try to okay. Yeah. Um, so one is uh, the anti-inflammatory -infl resp response. I just want to throw something back at you. We're going to be left with a chicken or egg question. 
because it could be the reduction in anxiety and depression and stress that elicits the anti-inflammatory property as opposed to the, you know, it could be the behavioral, the psychology that changes that then reduces cortisol or IL-6 or whatever, right? So it, we're always left with that type of conundrum, which kind of uh, excuse things. Uh, another quick question that just really, I love, 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 love your music study. It's, it's required reading in my lab, but I want to know, I want just want to bring us up. Um, talk to me about the music you chose. The music I chose. Well, I, I have to admit that I haven't, I haven't really fully chosen music yet. Um, uh, <laughs> for the study, <laughs> for the study. Or yeah. So, so, study. um, yeah. uh, wait, which, which study, which study the study where, um, you integrated psilocybin with music listening, uh, the, the, the cerebral cortex paper or yeah. the, wait, with the brain the one that, um, you found it, it was this title slide that said, what do psychedelics do to music? Which made, oh, yeah, think, yeah, yeah, yeah. which made me think the other way around, actually. What does music mean? Yeah, yeah. So, so again, full disclosure, I didn't design or conduct that study. Um, uh, Franz Wollenweider, uh, uh, Katrin Preller, and, and Marcus Herdner uh, designed, conducted, analyzed, and published that study. And I was able to do a secondary analysis on those data to publish the paper that, that we're, we're talking about now. So they chose, they chose the music in a certain particular fashion. So, so they chose music that, that was, they had participants uh, self select music that was personally meaningful to them. Um, and then the, the researchers went out and found music that was matched by style, genre, and general age. Uh, but that the individuals in the study, uh, it endorsed as not being meaningful to them. And then they had this completely third set of like, Franz told me it was like just a bunch of prog rock that, um, that nobody in the study liked, but he loved. And that was their like third condition. And, and so you had like personally meaningful music, matched music, and then like generally stable uh, neutral music. Everybody heard the same exact prog rock, uh, but every, uh, all the other, the, the meaningful and then the matched non-meaningful music was, was individually generated playlists. So separate pr playlists for every individual. Um, that actually matches in, in a way the work that I did in grad school using music as a tool to study emotion and memory in the brain at UC Davis. Um, we would actually choose music using this algorithm uh, that uh, on average, you know, 30% of the music evoked an autobiographical memory with people within people. Uh, another 30% of the music was on average familiar, but not autobiographically salient to people. And then another 30% of the music uh, yet was, was neither familiar nor meaningful nor familiar nor autobiographically salient to people. And, and it, it, it's, it, it's in it, the key to a couple of these studies is, is really trying to select music that is or isn't personally salient to a person. Um, uh, I, we haven't done that yet within, within uh, our psychedelic studies. The, the music that we've played for people under psychedelic drug effects, by and large, was music selected by uh, 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 Bill Richards. Uh, it's mostly Western art music, um, and uh, it follows this, this kind of progression of drug experience that was mapped out by Walter Pankey and Helen Bonney. In, at Maryland Psychiatric Institute in the 70s and their 60s really and then published in the 70s and and um, you know Bill follows this this um, formula that is based on lots of assumptions about what the arc of the psychedelic experience is and then what music should be optimal for a person when they're experiencing this arc of a psychedelic experience and um, I hope I'm not talking in circles here what one of the things that I really learned in grad school was, uh, probably obvious to most people who spend about five minutes thinking about it. We all react to music differently. We have these tricky things called preferences and idiosyncratic relationships with music that don't follow our preferences. But like, you know, I, I hate country music, but when I hear that one song, I'm just brought back to like senior prom and I danced with my crush and oh my God, it was amazing. So I hate country music, but I'll listen to that song. Um, you know, Music is complicated because people are complicated. Uh, you can't play the same music to every single person that comes through a study and expect them to all have the same experience. And that's pretty clear. It's pretty clear that that happens in our psychedelic studies where we play this general 
musical playlist that, that's built on mostly Western classical music. People have very varied uh, experiences when listening to that music. Uh, one of the studies that I want to run uh, involves building personalized playlists uh, for people uh, to, to go through this um, musical experience. And, and, and full disclosure, I'm a scientific advisor for wave paths and one of the things that wave paths is doing is trying to come up with personalized music for psychedelic sessions i'm not trying to sell you anything here uh uh but but there are essentially there are a lot of ways to address this problem one of the ways that wave paths is doing it is with generative music that has never been heard before because it's novelly composed by algorithms for each individual session. But on the complete other end of that spectrum is having someone come up with a personalized playlist of real real um popular music uh you know that's been you know recorded and produced uh and 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 that's an incredibly hard problem to solve though because uh part of what we did in grad school was try to select music that the person didn't tell us to select because it's much different if if, if you give me a list of music and and i say what's your favorite music and you give me that list of music and then you're in a session you hear it you're not going to think oh my god i didn't expect to hear this song let me involve this memory. You're going to think, oh, yeah, I told him about that. I, I, I expected to hear Jimi Hendrix or whatever. I mean, yeah, I, could, I could speak all day just about this, so I don't know how You're, much you want me yeah, to keep talking and, about and this. I, and I could probably <laughs> listen to you all day uh, talk about this. And I'm just going to ask one last question before I hand it off to Nicole to close us out. And um, Fred, in two minutes, what are you most excited about for the future of psychedelic research? You mean I have two minutes to think or two you don't have talk? two minutes to think about it. No. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So um wow, it's that's a that's maybe the most difficult question of the night. Um and it was great seeing you, man. Great job. Yeah. No, thanks. No, Fadal. I, I I wish I wish we saw each other more often. Um hopefully we can make that happen. Um, Patrick's got some stuff up his sleeve. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, yeah. Patrick and I were talking. Yeah. <laughs> um Good. Uh, yeah. So, so, I mean, it's, 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 it's invigorating and it's, it's humbling to see how, you know, how many incredibly hardcore and, and, and brilliant people are getting involved in this. So just that alone is really exciting. And, 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 and I, frankly, I'm, I'm, I can't wait to see what we do learn as much as I kind of threw cold water on the idea of cracking the hard problem conscious. I think there, you know, there, there are many multiple careers worth of excellent questions to ask here. Um, and, and, and I, I'm grateful for the, the collaborations that I'm, I've already struck up with people and then all the collaborations that are yet to come. Um, I, I'm, I'm excited at the prospect that, uh, at the end of all of this, we might actually help somebody. Um, when I was in grad school studying music, uh, I'd go to parties and tell people what I did. And they're like, oh, that's so cool. I love music. And then we'd strike up a conversation. And, and uh, I, I remember a couple of parties where like, you know, my friends who were doing visual science were like, I study Gabor filters. These are like geometric shapes that are like slightly fuzzy on one end. And people like, uh, okay. Um, but frankly, at the end of the day, like they had crises of conscious and, and, and so did I like, okay, this is all fun and I enjoy doing it, but what is it, what, who's going to help? What, what's, what's the end? I, I, and, and, and that was kind of an unfair and self-judgmental um, product of academia uh, I, I think ultimately it is completely fair to ask these crazy esoteric questions of neuroscience and psychology where you're looking at Gabor filters all day or, or trying to parse whether people can differentiate an F from an F sharp in a chord progression. I think that's important and it's self-valid and it's self-actuating and, and you don't have to explain it and you don't have to justify it. It's good science to so just do it. But, but it is truly motivating to to and sometimes it gets me out of bed in the morning to know that if if we are uh, this entire you know complex of scientists who are doing this stuff if 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 we do our job there might be a, a possibility that will help an incredible number of people and i i can't ex i can't i can't describe how humbling that is or or how motivating that is um and 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 exactly how we get across the finish line uh, that's part of the fun. That's going to be, you know, that's the, that's the journey, right? Um, uh, are we going to be able to treat depression? Are we going to be able to crack into bipolar disorder? What about substance use disorders, headaches, uh, OCD, trauma, pain, phantom limb pain? I mean, there, uh, the, 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 and try, after we get like 
any of these things done, going back and trying to figure out, well, wait, why does any of this work? Um, is 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 uh, I, I don't even really expect to be able to truly answer those questions in my lifetime. But but I I, I guess I'm like the ultimate epitome of a nerd in that this stuff is super exciting to me like those tiny little kind of esoteric questions like well what about this neuron and um i don't know that's that's what's exciting to me um and 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 there's there's just so many people going after this goal too like it's it's gotta work at some point right maybe not i guess we're gonna find out that's part of the part of the journey thank you yes going to be a fun one. Okay, great. Well, um, I know we didn't get to all the questions, but this was a very interesting discussion. And thank you again, Dr. Barrett, um, for the presentation. Um, thanks for spending your evening with us. It was an honor to have you. And uh, thank you, Dr. Zayden, for moderating the, the discussion. So, um, I think what I'll do is I'll pick out some of the topics from the chat and maybe we can collect some um, papers that we can send out to the group. I'll also send out a recording of this talk um, to the meetup. And um, thanks for everyone for attending and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Fadal. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.